All right, wonderful. I see some folks joining the room. We'll give folks about 30 or 45 minutes to get in. I'm sorry, 30 or 45 seconds to get in before we get started. Thanks all for joining us today for what we know is going to be a great webinar. All right, I see those numbers rapidly climbing. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Welcome everyone and thank you for attending today's Public Health Communications Collaborative monthly webinar. My name is Carrie Fox. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm CEO of Mission Partners. We are a social impact communications firm and certified B Corporation. I'm also the host of the Mission Forward podcast. For the past 20 years, I have used communications as a tool to advance equity and justice. And as such, my, often, my work often intersects directly with the work of public health professionals just like you. My team at Mission Partners and I have worked very closely with PHCC for the last 18 months or so to develop timely fact-based messaging and resources just like this one to support public health communicators around the country. So I am especially excited to be here with you today. At PHCC, as you may know, we try to select webinar topics that will be of the greatest interest and support to the field. You may recall we did a recent audience survey and heard from many of you interested in learning more about best practices and strategies for social media. No surprise there, given what we have seen in recent years, social media can be a blessing and a curse, right? As communicators, it can help us quickly disseminate information and stay connected to our communities, but we have also seen its dangerous effects. Information can be misrepresented, misconstrued, and flat out false. The spread of myths and disinformation can undermine communications efforts, particularly among historically marginalized communities. It can increase adverse health outcomes and it can erode trust in public health. But deep breath. That is why we have two incredible experts with us today. Today, we are going to hear from two public health communications experts who have embraced the potential of social media and found ways to navigate the exact challenges that I know many of you are facing. We are so happy to have with us Desiree Bradham, MPH, Social Media Manager for the Philadelphia Department of Public Health, and Lindsay Smith-Rogers, co-host of the award-winning Public Health On Call podcast and Associate Director of Content Strategy for Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Health, Public Health. Thank you both so much for being with us for this webinar. Now, I will tell you a little more about both of them in a moment, but first a couple quick logistics. During the presentation portion of this webinar, please submit your questions in the chat by sending a message to all panelists. Our speakers will have time to answer several of them before we conclude today's webinar. As is always the case, Today's webinar is being recorded, and that recording will be available on the PHCC website later this week, along with all of the previous webinars that we have held, as well as other COVID-19 communications resources. So with that, let me introduce you to our two panelists. I'll start with Desiree, as she'll be up first today with her presentation. Desiree Bradham is Social Media Manager for the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. She is responsible for the department's unique social media strategy and her unconventional ways of communicating include, include turning pop culture, memes, and social media trends into public health and pandemic response messaging. Her efforts have helped grow the department's social media presence and go viral, and she has helped solidify the health department's social channels as a trusted source something that I know we're all trying to, to aim towards. Desiree holds a master's degree in public health and she has worked in this field for six years. Desiree, thank you so much for being with us and we'll turn to you in a minute. But let me first introduce you to our second panelist, Lindsay Smith-Rogers. Lindsay is the Associate Director of Content Strategy for the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Lindsay is the producer and co-host of the award-winning Public Health On Call podcast and the Associate Director of Content Strategy at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Since 2010, she has worked for nonprofits and higher ed institutions, 
in Baltimore and internationally, in communications roles that emphasize writing, advocacy, public relations, and digital media. She has a master's degree in communication theory from the University of South Florida. Lindsay, thank you for being here with us today. So as a quick reminder, before I turn over the show to our wonderful experts, you can submit questions for our panelists at any time using the chat feature. Be sure to include your affiliation in your question submission if possible. And with that, I am so honored to invite Desiree to start us off with her presentation. Thank you, Carrie. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining today. And I am really excited to be here with you. Managing public health social media platforms, especially during a pandemic, has not been easy. But we've made many ways, we found many ways to make it fun and engaging. And I am really excited to show many, many examples of the unique ways in which we've kept Philadelphians informed. Maybe you're familiar with the state of New Jersey's Twitter account or the Department of Treasury's Twitter account, but I feel like Philly Public Health could definitely give them a run for their money. Today, I'm going to highlight our unconventional approach when it comes to public health messaging and the many ways that we turn pop culture and social media trends into pandemic response and other public health messaging in order to reach our residents to keep them informed. The examples I show you today will show you how this type of content has not only allowed us to strengthen our social media presence and increase, increase our following, but most importantly, it's gotten crucial public health information to Philadelphia residents. Next slide, please. So the Department of Public Health is on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Nextdoor. But Facebook and Twitter are our largest accounts. Since 2020, we've been able to increase our Twitter following by 331% and have put out over 10,000 tweets. On Instagram, we've increased our following by 270% with over 270 posts since 2020. We report impressions, engagement, engagement rate, number of posts, and number of followers monthly, and we use Hootsuite as our content scheduler. Our social media, construct, our social media strategy consists of language that is clear, easy to understand, and focuses on something specific, visuals that are eye-catching and easy to read, creative and engaging messaging that still shares critical information, content that is relevant, relatable, and culturally competent, and knowing and engaging with our audience and other organizations. Next slide, please. Okay, now let's get to the good stuff. I'm gonna show many examples of content that includes fun and creative language and visuals, but still shares that really important public health information. Because of this type of content, we've been able to increase our audience in order to reach more people. Although the health department is on various social media platforms, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just going to show examples from Twitter. Slide, please. I don't think I will ever be able to talk about Philly's public health social media without mentioning this tweet on the left. This was our first tweet to go viral. And the background behind it is, it was a very popular meme at the time of a very popular rapper by the name of Future. Now, although unconventional coming from a public health page, uh, this was all a part of our social media strategy, ensuring that our messaging was relevant, relatable, and culturally competent. Those who have been most affected by the pandemic in Philadelphia are those who look like me, young and or black. And in the beginning of the pandemic, when our messaging was fairly redundant, you know, reminding everyone to stay home, wash your hands, wear a mask, practice social distancing, I, I kind of struggled with how do I say the same thing without saying the same thing? Yes, it's very important that we stress the importance of hand washing, but how many times can I say, wash your hands? And it was clear that our messaging, it wasn't really reaching those who needed to hear it. And so we tailored our messaging in order to reach a specific target audience. Now, what I did was I studied my personal Twitter feed and I used it to see what it was that my peers were talking about. What was trending? What did they find interesting? What were they engaging with? And I used that content to create pandemic response messaging. The example on the right, I'm sure many people are familiar with the Eagles and Cowboys rivalry. And so we use that to message the importance of social distancing. Next slide, please. Knowing your audience is key. When you're developing content, it's important that you figure out 
who it is that you're trying to reach and what it is that you want them to know or to do. Everyone loves Beyonce, right? And everyone knows who she is. And so in the first example, I used a lyric by Beyonce as a way to message the importance of staying home if you're sick. In the middle, the purpose of this post was to emphasize the importance of masking. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. You're looking at the image and you're like, okay, I see Beyonce in the mask, but why is Philly Public Health wishing her a happy birthday? And what does that have to do with public health? Sometimes these random posts, they work because they get people engaging with your content. It gets them talking about it. And ultimately you're able to grow your audience. And so when you are posting the more direct and, and plain language content, now you have so many more people that you can reach. And now so many more people have access to this important information. The example on the right, um, this is a great example of showing how opening up a conversation with your audience is a great way to engage with them. Next slide, please. Well, it's not working, but she, she moves. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so Drake is another very popular hip hop artist and everything he puts out gets attention. And so I used two of his previous album covers as a way to message the importance of getting tested for COVID and getting vaccinated during pregnancy. Next slide, please. I'm sure many people are familiar with this very, um, very famous quote from Miss Congeniality. I use that as a way to message the importance of getting vaccinated and boosted. So in addition to pop culture, staying in the know of what's trending on social media also makes for great engagement. Very recently, this emoji trend was all over Twitter, all over Instagram. And it basically was, if I text you such and such emoji, this is what I really mean. And so I used it as a way to message the importance of staying hydrated, especially since it's been so hot. Um, and I did it with a little Philly spin because if you've ever been to Philly you've, or you've ever spoken to someone who's from Philly, you may notice that we pronounce uh, water as water. And so um, again, the importance of knowing your audience and knowing what will resonate. The last example, Wordle, another one I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but we use that as a way to message the importance of getting vaccinated, boosted, wearing a mask, and getting tested. Interacting with your audience is a great way to show that there's actually a real human or humans behind the account. And this also allows your audience to feel more connected. I do think that one of the things that has, um, that has helped us is that I do take the time to respond to our audience, whether it be publicly or through DM. Um, I encourage conversation on our platform. I interact with our audience and I highlight and feature them on our page. Next slide, please. Putting personality behind the account has also allowed me to create uh, great partnerships and relationships with other organizations and health departments. The example on the left is a public health rap battle that Philly and Baltimore and New York and Florida and other local health departments and even health departments in Canada, we all participated in this rap battle. And it was so much fun. The audience loved seeing their city or their health department interact with other health departments. Um, some even joined in and created their own lyrics. They gave their opinions on who won, which Clearly we did, um, but it was, it was great. And it turned out to be something huge. And the best part about it was we were all able to work together to get very important information out, but in such a fun and engaging way. The other example, um, this is just an example of engaging in conversation with your audience. So this person, they had gotten their child vaccinated. They shared the experience with us. They thanked us for it. And then a few days later, I followed up just to check in on their child. And this is um, another example of the importance of showing that there's a real person behind the account and connecting with your audience. Next slide, please. All right, so ending it with a few tips and tricks. Number one, know your audience, know your audience, know your audience. Um, I do think that's key. It's very important that your messages are actually tailored in a way that's going to resonate with the people that you're trying to reach. Knowing your audience goes beyond just knowing their demographics. It's important that you know how are they communicating, where are they communicating, what are they engaging with, what do they find interesting, and use that to create your content. 
Encourage interaction with your audience to help them feel more connected. So highlight, feature your audience on your page, um, start a conversation or join in one that's already happening. Let your audience know that there's a real person or people behind the account. Staying on top of pop culture and social media trends always makes for great engagement and content. Using a content scheduler is super helpful and post frequently. So right now on Twitter, we are posting about 15 to 20 times a day, um, just because we are starting to ramp up our COVID and monkeypox messaging. We do not post as much on all of our platforms and the number of times you post is really going to depend on um, your audience, what platform you're using, the topic, et cetera. And lastly, do not be afraid to take risks and have fun. In social media, you never know what's going to work unless you try it. And when you're creating content or you're wanting to try something new, think about what people are not doing. Public health messaging does not have to be boring. Yes, it is really important that you find that balance between the more direct and plain language content and the fun and creative and engaging content, but it's okay to have fun with it. Your audience will thank you. Next post, please. Literally. Next slide. And with that, I thank you all again. Feel free to give us a follow. And I look forward to speaking with you all shortly. That was fantastic. Desiree, thank you. The chat is blowing up with questions and so many good ones. Uh, know that we are going to get to as many of these questions as we can after our second presentation. So keep them coming. And um, thanks so much for the great presentation and the great engagement by our audience. Thank with so that, much. let me set up our next uh, panelist today, um, Lindsay Smith Rogers. And as a reminder, please do submit questions for Lindsay as she is speaking. Um, we've got folks watching those in the background and then we'll go to questions after Lindsay wraps her conversation. So Lindsay, the floor is yours. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I've been told I have too many slides and keeping things succinct is not my forte. So I'm gonna do my best. I might be running through these very quickly, but I know these will be made available to you after the fact. Um, they've already, next slide, please. They've already introduced me. So we'll go to who we are. We are the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, you can go back to the previous slide. There we go. Um, and these are our uh, platforms. Hopefully you have heard of us or seen us. If not, this is where you can find us. Next slide, please. So you can go forward. Okay, um, COVID-19 created this crazy information environment, lots of misinformation, people needed trusted info. Um, so I structured this presentation by some frequently asked questions to unpack some of our process and strategy and shed some light on how we've measured success during the pandemic. I was watching some of the questions come in on the chat and hopefully I'm gonna get to a few of those, including the copyright question, which was a good one. Um, I'm actually filling in for our uh, Associate Director of Audience Engagement, Nick Moran, but he and I really work in tandem. And so I'm gonna be sharing a little bit about our strategy uh, here, but I am a content strategist. And so I'm covering this more from a content strategy lens, which I'll get into a little bit more. Next slide, please. Biggest question we get, who's running our accounts? Next slide. Usually people guess that we're an elder millennial in there somewhere, they're not totally wrong, but content is a team effort. So again, as I said, uh, we've got strategists, Nick Moran and myself, um, and our team is made up of writers, designers and illustrators who all contribute. We were able to retain a vendor during the pandemic. Um, we also fact check and gut check most of our content against subject matter experts. And I'll talk a little bit about approvals too. I saw that question come in through the chat. Um, and then we have a few people who are actually the ones pushing publish. Next slide, please. Where do you get your ideas? Okay, next slide, here we go. Uh, can you go for, can you advance the slide please? I think these got a little bit out of order. Okay, um, we're gonna go back to that previous slide in just a moment. So this is a diagram that was made by Nick Moran in a presentation that he gave recently. Like I said, we've been kind of working in tandem on this. So essentially, um, our approach has been through the pandemic to have this Trojan horse. We've got this life-saving public health information. And then we've got 
it's packaged up with this colorful artwork with some recognizable Easter egg jokes, things like that sense of humor, which um, obviously Desiree's team also does quite well. And we are presenting ourselves to these iPhone users who are scrolling Instagram and Facebook. And if you peruse our content, you're going to see this pattern. Could you go back to the previous slide? So our ideas ladder up to three things, um, developing key messages, understanding our audience, and having a specific goal for each piece of content. Key messages are really important. These are the things that people need to know and understand about topics. I work very closely with our audience engagement strategists to see what kinds of questions people are asking. Um, but we also work with our Center for Health Security. So for example, this, what you're seeing here is, um, a sample content strategy. These were our areas of focus from January to March, 2022. We obviously wanted to talk about antivirals, Paxlovid was coming on the scene then, pediatric vaccination, transparency around changing guidance, which is always tricky. And of course, continuing to talk about mask wearing. We also know our audience, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we divide that up. So we first have the, what I call the, if you know, you know followers. We know that they're about 25 to 45, and for whatever reason, women 55 and older. These are people who follow pop culture and pop science. These are our biggest fans. These are the people who subscribe to us, follow us, they love us. That's one audience. Then there's our target audience, especially during the pandemic for specific messages. And there we're really going for the movable middle. We're not going after the anti-vaxxers. We have exclusionary bounds on how we target our messaging. And another area of this is we have had great success with what we call influencing the influencer. So for example, younger people who might recognize memes and pop culture who have those at-risk people in their orbit. So nieces, nephews, grandchildren, um, they're gonna see this content and we are helping to make them better communicators with the people around them. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that approach in a minute. We also, of course, have inclusive language. We work with native speakers for Sp Spanish language posts. We work with the Center for American Indian Health on content for Native American and First Nation people. And in general, we try to be really respectful. We don't wanna make assumptions about our audience or talk down to them. Um, and we always acknowledge what we don't know. And then in terms of specific goals, each piece of content should answer a question. It should be aiming to influence behavior or surfacing things that need attention. For example, how to identify misinformation, um, explaining why it would be premature for the US to end the COVID response, things like that. You can go to the next slide, please. And next slide, yep. How do you measure your success? Next slide, please. So on its face, we could measure success by reception, likes, shares, engagement, but we really wanted to know, are we effectively changing behavior by surfacing knowledge? Next slide, please. This is an example of that influencing the influencer campaign. And I really wanna point this one out because not only are we actually not going after people who might be on the fence about getting vaccinated for COVID-19, um, we're going after people who are probably very much into vaccines. Maybe they've already gotten vaccinated. We're trying to educate them on how to talk to others. But this serves a sort of a hidden purpose in that someone who's on the fence about getting vaccinated will still see this content and not feel like it's directly calling them out. So we've had a lot of success with that. We started running campaigns like this, and we were able to develop a partnership with Meta, um, which has Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp, where our content was distributed, wide, distributed widely with other health partners like the UN, the CDC. And then they actually measured audience responses with survey questions about our content. So in this case, Meta would show our content to a unique targeted audience. And again, we're going after that movable middle. We're not going after the anti-vaxxers. We had some exclusionary targeting there. And then later ask them survey questions that would show up in their Facebook feed. And what we found is that individuals were much more likely to feel confident about vaccines after seeing our content than individuals who did not. I do wanna acknowledge here that not everyone has a partnership with Meta. Behavioral change is really hard to measure without extensive data, as we all know. Um, but that's part of why we're here. We're here to talk about what's worked for us and how we know it works and so that other people in public health communications can iterate on our successes. So COVID really has been a game changer for us. This is evidence that we can provide information that can help people make decisions around their own health and safety. And we can iterate on this beyond COVID. We can talk about flu shots, childhood vaccinations, mental health, things like that. Next slide, please. 
it's also important to note that there are things that are within our success and excuse me, there are things that are within our control and things that are not. So within our control, our strategy workflow and content creation, which I'll talk a little more about, um, analysis, experimentation and innovation, and then pretty much everything else. So we could not control the pandemic. We could not control whether or not we had a partnership with an organization like Meta. And we couldn't control going, going viral. Next slide, please. Going viral is 10% being in the right place at the right time and 90% pure luck. This uh, Home Alone post had the low, low price of $0 paid promotion. It was seen by 12.5 million people. We uh, were retweeted by Daniel Stern himself, who's an actor in those films. It just went viral. It was the right time, right place. Uh, wasn't something we could control, but we certainly celebrate that success. Next slide. What problems did you have to solve? Next slide. A lot of people asking about copyrights. This is probably not the best advice. My legal team would probably not agree with this, but ask forgiveness. We have walked a fine line with copyrights. So far through the entire pandemic, we have only ever had to remove one post. I'm not allowed to say which post that is, but I say, go big or go home, see what you can get away with. You can always ask forgiveness. Ideally, lawyers aren't going to come after a health department or a school public health. They'll just ask you to take it down. So again, this probably isn't the best on the books advice, but this is what we've done. Next slide, please. So this is where I want to get into content strategy. So content strategy at its core is problem solving around people, plans, and processes. So for example, um, with people, we had a bandwidth issue, as I'm sure many of you have. So with design, we had one illustrator on staff, which we were extremely fortunate to have. I know not everyone has that. And several people with basic graphic design skills. So that's where we came up with the template approach. So these are basic templates that were built that could be manipulated by people with more basic skills so that we can be churning out content quicker that has a nice branded look and feel. And then in terms of plans, we try to balance our response versus a set agenda. So we have a content schedule that has room for responses to breaking news, like when the CDC drops a mask requirement. Uh, and we also keep a backfill of evergreen content handy just in case you need it. I've seen some questions also about approvals and workflow. We had a huge problem with bottlenecks. We have a lot of experts that were really busy during the pandemic. They were teaching, they were testifying, they were publishing and doing all the things they should be doing. We came up with a system around key messages where we would draft a script based on evidence questions needed to be answered. They would review a single script. And then from that script, we would then pull out pieces of content for our content. So that way they didn't have to review each individual piece of content going out. We had this blessed content to work with. Next slide, please. We cannot say this enough, and I know as public health practitioners, you feel this, building a social media approach and presence and consistency requires a healthy team. We found rhythms and workflow that work best for us. We found a sustainable working pace. It took us some time. We learned how to refine our design and approval processes to minimize those disruption and bottlenecks. We address those things when they happen. We frequently stop and check in with each other and ourselves. How are things going? What problems have come up? How can we solve this? If one person is at risk of burning out, the entire team is at risk of burning out. Next slide. Couple of final thoughts here. So the first one, next slide, please. Uh, I'm gonna go with what Desiree said. Go big, take risks. For those of you that are not familiar, we did a, um, let's call it the WAP parody. We called it our wear a mask parody. It's hilarious. It got tweeted by Cardi B, which was just the utmost. Um, don't be afraid to go big as long as you're balancing these big social media moments with that consistent content. Next slide, please. And finally, again, consistency is key. Social media messaging requires you finding your own formula, your own workflow, your own templates that allow you to show up day after day. You can riff off of your successes, but make sure you're constantly listening and recalibrating your tone, your topics, and then make decisions based on your goals. Remember those goals? And on data, what is working and what isn't and be in it for the long haul. We were not just in it for the pandemic. We've been around for a while. We now have a model of how to disseminate actionable guidance and news you can use. And I will end there.
Thank you, Lindsay. Again, so many questions coming in, so many great insights you just shared. Um, thanks to you both for the terrific insights and practical wisdom that you share. Now, I know we've got a lot to get to in the next 30 minutes or so to be able to answer what we see coming through. And we've got some folks on the back end looking at themes for those questions. Um, we may uh, think about other ways we can get to all the questions we don't get to today. But I'm gonna start us off with a question for both of you, and it'll be a two-part question. So I'll ask you the first part, and then we'll go to the second part. But I'd love to ask how these last two years, we've seen come through on the chat folks talking about Burnout, how do we keep this work up? It requires so much mental energy to be able to build the content and manage the handles. But as you think about your work over the last two years as social media managers, how have these two years informed the work that you're doing? And what do you see as most essential to the public health communication strategies that you are executing? Who wants to take that one first? I can jump in. Um, again, I'm coming from that content strategy lens. So my whole job is people, plans, and processes. Um, so I problem solve all day, every day. It can be exhausting, but and you know, as soon as you've solved one problem, another crops up. But I found that if you make room for these conversations throughout your process, you can sort of get on top of something before it becomes totally out of your control um and then i think also documenting and codifying these workflows and processes um can be really helpful and using data to justify the decisions that you're making so if you have the money to cobble together to hire a contractor or another person show the impact that that person is making if you um, have developed a strategy and an approvals process that is working show the impact of that content so that when other people above you are making decisions you have something to back that up you know we have built a model during covid not just of consistency for our external audiences but we have become known as a team that is reliable and consistent for our internal people as well so our experts trust us that when they tell us something we're going to communicate that responsibly yeah, great so lindsay i'm going to double down on one piece you just said that i want to make sure people hear today which is context matters and use data to justify your decisions as you're looking to grow and scale desiree let's hear from you the same question how have the last two years as a social media manager informed your work now and what do you see as most essential to the public health communication strategies you execute online. So expanding on what Lindsay had said when it comes to data, data includes qualitative and quantitative, right? So again, going back to, for me, it's everything I do is about knowing your audience, knowing what do they find pressing? What do they care about? If you're posting about, I don't know, mosquitoes, but you see that your audience wants to know more about monkeypox, you're, you know, you're not reaching them. And so knowing your audience is key and you get to know your audience by researching, well, knowing your audience, um, learning the people that surround you, being a part of your audience. I see a lot of people asking, how do you know your audience? I mean, I'm, I'm part of our target audience. Um, and spending a lot of time on social media to see what it is people care about. Excellent, great. So know your audience, get close to your audience, understand your audience. I love that. So now I'll ask you both the flip side of that question. Uh, we've seen some thread come through in the chat around naysayers and people who are putting content on your, on your channels that's not useful. What have you found to be the biggest distraction to your ability to make impact online? Trolls. <laughs> trolls. 100% trolls. Yes. Um, you know, you work very hard to create content that's getting very important information out and often having to do so with just 280 characters. And when the trolls come and they put information or they wanna be combative or just ruin your day, it, it is such a huge distraction. I, I was gonna say, um, we have sort of an interesting approach to trolls that uh, it's unique from any place else that I've ever worked. Um, we actually mine trolls for ideas for content because a lot of the time, some of the things that they're saying, even if it sounds 
just way off in left field, sometimes they're picking up on a piece of misinformation that we've missed. And they are, they are giving us a clue as to, okay, this person, like what they're saying, what do you mean give someone like horse medicine for COVID? What are you talking about? No, they're tapping into something that else that's out there, some misinformation that we might be able to address. The other thing I will say about trolls is that not every, especially in the context of COVID-19, not everybody who asks questions or pushes back on you is a troll. People have questions. People that are vaccine hesitant or perhaps just in general have questions about vaccines. Maybe they genuinely don't know that mRNA technology has been around for decades, for example. It is worth listening to those people and it is worth answering their questions truthfully and honestly. On the other hand, if they are a straight up troll, just ignore them. And we have also seen some really interesting conversations where our fans have come to our defense in the comments section and we don't even have to do anything. So that's kind of been our approach. Awesome. I want to go there for a minute and it sets us up for our next uh, question around capacity. But um, you mentioned early on that um, you're right now doing about 15 tweets a day. You're trying to ramp up some content how much and this will be a question for both of you so whoever wants to start how much are you thinking about developing and pushing content versus literally being online and responding to questions that are coming in how do you balance your time in that way or your team's time that's a good question that's really hard um <laughs> and Lindsay, feel free to chime in whenever i mean i'm gonna say it's like 90 10 <laughs> like 90 percent us focusing on pushing out content and 10% analyzing what's coming back in with one exception. And that is, um, we do have listening mechanisms built in. So the comment section, not always the most illuminating in terms of feedback, but we have email addresses that we monitor. We have direct messages that we monitor. So I think we sort of try to put our energy where people have made an effort to reach out to us as opposed to some keyboard courage person just responding to a post. Yeah, good insight. Desiree? Well, I, I personally just love social media. So I'll be honest, I'm on <laughs> social media all day, every day. I want to see, especially when it's content that I feel like, oh yeah, everyone's gonna love this. I wanna see what they're saying. So um, I probably don't really have a healthy balance. I probably spent too much time <laughs> analyzing what people are saying. But Lindsay's advice is great. 90 10. <laughs> I mean, it is it is a fun thing to do just to look at the comments sometimes. And that's also how you get ideas. And that's what I learned about what's trending. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Does that ever inform? And I can speak from PhD because I know that um, some of our social media has informed what tools we then create. So if we see uninformed or maybe misaligned questions come in, we think gosh, that could be the basis of a really important resource because that could be redirecting of some maybe um, inaccurate information we see spreading. Do you ever see trends or themes like that? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, as recently as April, we have had to put out content explaining that there are not microchips in vaccines, but that is a persistent piece of misinformation. And as long as we're still seeing it, you know, we're gonna slide it in here and there. Right, right. so that, head down listening while you may not be engaging or re-engaging with every message that's coming your way, it's an important listening tool, as you've both said, to be able to then inform what content you create. Okay, we've seen a lot of questions about capacity. Um, you all are, uh, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you find the time to get so creative and to get so in depth to the work that you're doing, but you're, the, the audience wants to know. So here's the question. <laughs> Limited capacity is a big problem across the board for public health communicators and professionals. Social media folks are doing lots of other communications work. So sometimes the most fun or creative stuff takes the back seat. How do you recommend um, setting up a team or ensuring that there is the capacity to get to the depth that you've been able to get to? Who wants to take that first? Um, well, on Philly's side, our we have a total of six people on our team, but when it comes to social media, there's one person, and that one person is me. Um, so how we do it is, um, I do have a really great team that's able to 
you know, give ideas, but when it comes to like the actual content creation, that is all me. So capacity is limited on this side. Um, and sometimes it is a struggle time trying to find a balance, but that's why I use the content schedulers. Um, content calendars are great. And just really making sure I'm on top of whatever is pressing. And I will say we are very fortunate to have a team of about 12 people. There's still only one person that's actually technically social media, but we have about 12 contributors. And in addition, I did mention that we were able to retain a vendor for much of um, the pandemic. But I come from a background, my previous jobs, I was a team of one. I have been there. I totally understand. And my advice always when I was in those positions was to pick a channel and do it really, really well go really in depth mm -hmm. on one channel. You can cross post, you know, it's super easy to cross post from Facebook to Instagram or, you know, vice versa or post things on YouTube and bring them, you know, create your content in different formats so that, you know, you have one piece of content going out to different platforms. But then when you're doing that listening, when you're doing that planning, really just focus on one platform because that's going to be so much easier to manage in the long run and again like those content schedulers as desiree mentioned are lifesavers let's dig in there for a minute i think that is such an important point that again we saw some questions come up on the strategy behind where to put your time or where to put your resources so talk a little bit more both of you or whoever wants to grab this one on how you, you determined who was that target audience you were really gonna dig into that helped you then figure out which channel to prioritize. I can jump in <laughs> if you want. Um, so we started out with, um, we looked at our, our Instagram audience first. And the reason being is that prior to the pandemic, we had already been using that as our sort of sandbox to play around with fun content. You know, we knew that our audience there was mostly students and alumni. So we knew the approximate ages and, and demographics of people who were following us. So we kind of started there and then we started growing it out to other platforms. Um, and, and, you know, the platforms, so Twitter, for example, is our platform is more of a conversation with other public health entities. Facebook now has grown into probably one of our largest unaffiliated audiences because of that partnership with Meta. Um, but we did start in a place where we had the most room to sort of push the envelope without alienating the audience that was there. Super helpful. Does there anything you want to add to that one? Um, I do. I, we did something very similar. So our when we first, well, when I first started. Um, Twitter, we only had about 8,000 followers, but Facebook has always had a huge following. And so Twitter is where I was able to, you know, push down a little, a little bit. And then I saw how our audience grew there, but not really on our other platforms. Um, so I think just playing around with it and knowing that our audience on Facebook is completely different from our audience on Twitter, which is completely different from our audience on Instagram and so on and so on. And so, um, okay, so your audience, right? And focusing or depending on what it is that we are posting about um, having the appropriate channel, but for us has always been Twitter. Yeah, great. All right, let's switch gears just a little bit and talk about another stream of questions we've come in around the difference between Creative Commons, publicly available content and copyright issues. Um, <laughs> we know that there's a, a line there, right? In terms of content that's available, that's, that's distributed, that can be redistributed and content that is copyrighted. When do you think about engaging a, a legal team, if ever, or, you know, how do you draw that line to make sure that if, uh, for those who are listening, who let's call them more cautious bosses that they are working with, how they do kind of do right by content and how content can be distributed? We've never had that issue. I did see a lot of questions <laughs> saying, you know, how were you able to use Beyonce or Drake or this person? We've never had a copyright issue. Um, a few of the images was actually, they were actually created by our mayor side, which works very closely with the law, with our law team. So I'm assuming they were approved, but that's, I've never experienced that. Yeah, I haven't either. And, and I do want to say like, we have certainly walked a fine line 
And like I said, we've only ever had to remove one piece of content. And that was the end of the conversation. They just said, can you take this down? And we said, sure, no problem. Um, I think in general, when it comes to our messaging, especially around COVID, brands and figureheads are quite forgiving because they are typically behind our messaging. You know, so it's not like we're messaging something hugely controversial. Um, you know, most of the people that we feature and, oh, I should also add, we do make sure that when we feature, um, for example, celebrities or, or anything that's pop culture, we do a quick gut check to make sure that that particular individual is vaccine, <laughs> pro vaccine. Uh, so just to give you an example, we actually had a screenshot of, if you all remember Bad Baby from the Dr. Phil show, uh, we actually did a deep dive on her Twitter and found out that she was like, get the vaccine, y'all. And we were like, okay, we can use her. So we, we do try to make sure that we're not promoting someone that is anti-vax or that is counter to the message we're trying to put out there. Excellent. Good. So I'll, I'll note for folks who are online, we see so many questions coming in on this thread and we want to be able to go a little deeper for you all. So um, expect that there may be some um, overflow or follow-up questions that we answer for all you. This may be one of those follow-up PHCC resources we create to help guide you in making those decisions when you're building your creative content online. So thanks to both of you for that, that extra content. We have time for, I think, two more. So I'm just going to go through and make sure that I'm hitting the key themes that we're, uh, that we're hearing from our audience. I want to double down on something that uh, came up a few times and, and maybe, again, practical um, answers or insights we can share with the team. There were some questions on how to respond when you see trolls. Do you ignore them? At some point, do you respond to them? Do you um, seek guidance from other members of your team on that? What has been the strategy when you see uh, an increase of troll activity on your platform? For the most part, we do, enjoy, uh, we do ignore them. There have been a few times, depending on my mood, um, I have engaged with them um, and it's brought more engagement to our account. Um, a lot of people find it to be funny. And so again, just finding that balance between funny content and the more serious one. But overall, and especially depending on what it is that they're saying, we we ignore it. Or like Lindsay said, we do use it as an opportunity as an opportunity to create a um, content to address the misinformation or whatever it is that they're saying. I agree. And I will say that there's one caveat to all of this, and that is um, if you are starting to get threatening content that there's a difference between a troll that's out to like ruin your day and and truly threatening content we've gotten emails we have gotten dms you know make sure you have a plan among your team members as to how to handle that usually you would hand that off to you know for example johns hopkins has like a cybersecurity anti-harassment you know, email that you can forward these things to, and they will look into it to determine if it is a threat. So this is, a, it's really important to have these conversations with people within your organization so that you know what your options are. And you can use your gut to feel out whether something is just kind of icky versus truly threatening. Great. I'm going to go back to the way we started this uh, webinar today, which we talked about the great benefit of social media and being an incredible real-time tool to disseminate information across audiences. And of course, it also has um, downsides to it that we need to be mindful of. And that's where we're just coming off of. But let's go back to the benefit for a minute. How do you all recommend presenting, you know, if we've got folks on the line who are saying, I want to do this, you've inspired me, I'd love to dig in more, but I'm going to need to prove to my team that it is worth the investment to spend time, more time on social media and to build out that content. What is the proof point or what's the, um, the argument you make that investing in social media strategy is essential to public health communication? I mean, I can start and just say like, call upon the examples that we've listed here. You know, I mean, Desiree gave some really great examples of how, you know, a department of public health, which really should be, con you know, really connected to its population. You're doing such a good job engaging with people. Um, and we, you know, on our side, we actually have data that shows we are able to change behavior. And so these two case studies alone, you can reference, you can use these presentations and say, hey, this is a blueprint to how we can actually start doing this. Totally agree. 
Great. All right, we're gonna get super technical for a minute. I know we're coming to the end. I wanna to try to squeeze in as many as we can. What are some of the tools you use to help inform the data and insights that you have? So someone was asking about how you find out more about algorithms, how you um, track demographic data, how you're generally using you know, the back end of these networks. Are there a third party platforms that you're using or relying on? Um, we use just really the uh, the analytics. So like on Twitter, we just dive into the analytics and analyze them from there. We don't use, yeah, we don't use anything else other than just. Yeah, ours as well. And, and I do want to just bring up one thing I mentioned during my presentation about exclusionary data. So you want to know as much as you can about your audience, but you also want to know who you're not trying to reach, especially if you're getting into like targeted promotion. You know, again, we're not going after anti-vaxxers. We're not going after people who might, they're just not going to budge. That's not, that's not our bread and butter. So I think knowing who you don't want to reach is also important. You know, I know there are some folks who have asked, why don't you go after the anti-vaxxers? What you just said, Lindsay, I think is a really important point to reinforce that when we think about from a communications or marketing campaign, and you may have mentioned it earlier, there's what we call the movable middle, right? There are the folks who are on board and open to hear the information and um, will, will not just listen to what you have to say, but may actually be champions to help you spread that message. Um, there are folks who are on the complete opposite end who are really trying to downplay or um, dispute everything you say, and there is not a lot of positive energy in trying to engage them. And then there's what we call the movable middle, right? Folks who are listening and may be engaged and therefore may take action because of what you're sharing. But let me ask you, is, is there anything else you would um, tag onto or add on to that in terms of how you think about who you're engaging along that spectrum? Yeah, absolutely. There are tons. So we have the Center for Health Security um, in the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. They have an entire arm of people that study um, what's called disinformation. So there's a difference between mis and disinformation. Misinformation is someone who has maybe heard something wrong or, you know, for example, like, oh, it doesn't really matter if I get a booster because I'm going to get COVID anyway. You know, that's misinformation. Disinformation is in is uh, incorrect facts facts that are sowed by people that are seeking to create discord. So these could be nation states, it could be individuals. There's an agenda behind it. It can be really hard to break those out. Um, but again, there are resources online. If you look this up, a ton of people have done very deep dives into identifying dis versus misinformation. Misinformation is worth engaging with for sure, because there's usually a kernel of truth in there somewhere and it's just been kind of twisted or, or people just don't know the context. Disinformation, there are entities that specifically go after that. It is a huge time investment. Usually it's not just disinformation. There's some sort of agenda behind it. And we could have a whole other separate webinar about this that is outside of my area of expertise. But um, my recommendation is to Google this issue, read up on it, and you're going to start to see what kinds of things are worth engaging with and what kinds of things are not. Fantastic. All right, we are now officially going to go to our last question. And to those comments I saw in chat, yes, there will be a transcript. There will be, um, actually, this recording will be online later this week. So we will share back, back out the resources that we have shared with you today. Final question. Uh, we have seen how important public health communications are, especially these last few years. So I want you each to think and maybe give one thought on what professional development do you recommend for public health workers that are now charged with social media management, but maybe haven't had formal health communications training? Anything come to mind? That's a good this question. Always <laughs> I, you know, I've worked in public health for six years, but I was kind of thrown into the communication side. So that's a really good question. <laughs> I mean, webinars like this one are really helpful. I think the biggest thing you can do, especially if you have a limited budget, and I know this is a big ask, ask for time, just time to poke around online and, and start to work on a, a side project, if you will, like, I mean, and then kind of the professional development stuff, you see what opportunities are out there that are very specific to what you're trying to do. 
Um, in terms of resources, obviously, Public Health Communications Collaborative is a great resource. Um, you know, there's tons, like I said, about mis and disinformation, but I think if you can't ask for budget, ask for time. Right, and I'll double down on that one. You know, like any skill that you're trying to practice and learn, it requires ongoing practice and learning. And especially as you two know firsthand, this field changes so rapidly. The platforms change so rapidly that you know, many times I think folks who invest in long-term programs get out of that program and feel like what they learned has already changed. So time, Lindsay, I love that. If, if folks can advocate for more time to listen, to learn, to watch folks like you and you know, think about how to create a community of practice, right? Reach out to one another. And if you see something that seems to be working, reach out and, and learn more about it from that person directly. Um, and certainly we agree, THCC will continue to be a reference for you all. And we know there's a lot more work we will do on this topic in the coming months. With that, enormous thanks to the two of you for so many insights you shared today. I'm gonna open up a poll or a member of my team will open up a poll here. Um, as a final question, we're hoping everyone can answer. And when we see that pop up, I can read it to you all as well. Okay, there it is. So let me just read this for folks who uh, need support. What types of communications resources from THCC would be most useful and valuable? And go ahead and select all that apply. There's a number of things here. Take a moment um, to read those and check your answers. Give you just about a minute to do that. All right, Tim, you can go ahead and close that poll if you haven't already. And to all of you who joined us today, thank you so much for joining us for this great conversation. As always, you can find the latest messaging and resources for communicating about COVID-19 at the PHCC website, which is publichealthcollaborative.org. Our latest resources include a pediatric vaccine social media toolkit, so be sure to check that one out and top line messaging on topics such as monkeypox and Novavax. With that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and thank you so much for the incredible work that you all do.